Lynn Lee. Yep. Today I will interview Calvin Beck, a veteran of World War II. This interview is a part of the Veterans Oral History Project. The interview is being conducted in the Riley County Office Building, located at 115 North 4th Street in Manhattan, Kansas. The camera operator for the recording is Dana Doddridge. Today's date is 7 October 2003. Calvin, for the record, will you give us again your name, rank, serial number, if you remember it, and your branch of service? Well, I'll have to give you the uh, rank I last had was a National Guard rank. I was a second lieutenant Good. and released for National Guard and just prior to uh, the uh, Korean conflict. And uh, I missed that boat ride by 23 days. I see. My transfer from state to state to fulfill my National Guard obligation. But when I, I entered the service, the prior to World War II, in the third day of January 1940, and uh, I enlisted for foreign, what was called then Foreign Service, which was Hawaii being a territory, it was considered Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. So that was my first uh, entry, and where I served about the longest period of time, any one time, was in until after December 7th and 41. I was uh, mostly involved with training personnel and. Uh, as we call it in later days, we called it a DEI. We was a drill instructor for quite a while. Sure. Training troops that came from the various islands of Hawaii. It was especially after they started the uh, year of mandatory service that they had. If you probably would recall, that was what was what happened to get the personnel involved and get them trained. This happened uh, during the year of 41. And that's where I was utilized for a training instructor until the war broke out when I, I rejoined my own outfit, which is in the 21st Infantry. And uh, they, uh, I, they gathered up personnel that was uh, the key personnel in the cadre to make a cadre to return to the United States uh, after our experience with Pearl Harbor and all this was uh, probably geared down and slowed down to where we could make some sense out of everything. Calvin, yeah. let me break in. Were you in Hawaii during Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was. You were. I was just, were you at Schofield Barracks? I was, no, I was at, happened to be at Hickam Field. At Hickam. Yeah. We was training. Uh, uh, at that time, the, it was called the Air Corps, yes. the, the, Air, the Air Force, which is now the Air Force, and we were training, doing, giving basic training to the, uh, the Air Corps the signees, or, or I would say, detain or the ones that came over to fulfill uh, their obligations when they came into service. I'm talking about our regular army people, and this was a, a volunteer thing until well, late late in '41 when we when they started. Well, December the seventh and everything, they started bringing people in uh, and drafting people later from that. But before that, everybody was volunteers. Sure. Now you went uh, back to the states with the 21st a cadre from the 21st Infantry. I, I, I broke in on you there. Continue with that, if you will, we, uh, please. Was sent uh, to train uh, the Rainbow Division, which was, uh, as you could call it, probably from history. Uh, they were a World War One with and involved uh, such personnel as uh, uh, our former president, that uh, Harry Truman, that we all familiar with, yeah. especially people of our age and so forth. And um, he, he was a member of the Rainbow Division in World War One, but this was supposed to be a, a gathering of personnel from all the, at that time, 48 cons contiguous states, which is what we had at that time, 48. And um, so we uh, had personnel from all of those states to build on and make the Rainbow Division. I see. And uh, we did uh, train one uh, commit to uh, division strength of people, and then they, they broke them up into fit blocks of 50 and sent them overseas to, to the Pacific and to Germany. And that was about the time that I, uh, I desired to go elsewhere, and I volunteered for the, the uh, 
paratroopers and went to Fort Benning, Georgia and took parachute training. And uh, after the training down there, just uh, 19 days after the invasion, in, in June 6th, I uh, arrived in England. My unit that was going to be assigned to the 82nd Airborne were in, still in France at that time, being deployed there be, during, during an, the night of December 6th and 7th. And uh, they later returned to the base camp, camp in England and my first combat time was whenever I was, uh, went to Operation Market Garden in Holland. We jumped there on September 17th and, uh, in 44 and uh, deployed and crossed the river in Nijmegen, by Ni in Nijmegen. Calvin, I remember reading about that. Uh, there was a uh, book written about called One Bridge Too Far. Yes. Uh, and I believe General Montgomery uh, was a field marshal at that time. I think he planned that uh, operation, did he not? That, that's true. Tell me something about that operation as you remember it. That was the, the operation, uh, our, our operation, Market Garden, is, is uh, related somewhat, quite a lot, to the uh, bridge too far she alluded to. And we, um, like I say, we, we um, concluded our operation. We are always assigned a certain thing to... Uh, bring into fruition and whenever you're assigned in a, a various units to take over certain territories and, and certain places and consolidate forces and things like this. And uh, we were, were waiting patiently for, we were supposed to have been joined on the ground. We, as you can imagine, we, we were deployed and jumped with, from aircraft and we had to have some uh, support from field, from uh, people in the field, from on ground troops that has the equipment and heavy artillery and so forth to, to uh, contain and to make our operation success. We needed armor and artillery to, to support us, which we didn't have because paratroopers don't have that kind of equipment when you jump out of an airplane. But uh, we uh, waited patiently for the English forces to there was a quarter at that time from Belgium up there and then because of lack of support or a whole lot of things, people can blame anybody and everybody for mm -hmm. their uh, misfortunes in war and meeting responsibilities and schedules and so forth, but we had to wait. Instead of the three days that we told that we would be joined by land army, it was about nine days, so we it slowed down our operation quite a lot. Because Cal Calvin, I've always had a great admiration for General Ridgeway. Was he the commander of the 82nd at that time? No, the, his, uh, our commander was General Jim Gavin. Gavin, okay. You probably heard the term jumping, jumping Jim, Jim Gavin. Gavin. I have a great admiration for this man, too. Mm -hmm. uh, was the division run very well at that time, as far well, as you're concerned? I realize you're waiting for the, the armies from the south meet you and there's about six days late getting there of course. That This is true and uh, this uh, was frustrating for the division staff as well as company and battalion staffs yeah. down to lower echelons and, and uh, we just had to hold up our set to, to conclude our portion of the operation we had to wait until we had sufficient support to uh, uh, reinforce us and to keep us in position once we arrived there. See, because we was having problems, particularly at night, we'd uh, take over a, a, some terrain, and particularly an example was a little town of Beek, Holland, and that's where I first had eyeball eyeball contact with uh, Jumping Jim Gavin <laughs> in that little town, and we had been in there about three times, and. The Germans would come in there at night under the cover of darkness with their armor, which we didn't have yet. Oh. And uh, so we would relink, have to relinquish down after a good firefight, and then we'd go back the next day and, and do it all over again. This happened three different times. And, yeah. and I recall Jim saying, well, Sergeant, he said, uh, are we going to stay this time? And I said, I have every intent of doing that, sir. <laughs> I remember the last, the only word I ever said to General Gavin. Thing. But he's a wonderful commander. Everybody admired him, and he was well respected and a good commander. After this operation was over, where did the 82nd go then? We uh, 
deployed uh, back into uh, into uh, France to a base camp, and uh, we stayed there. Uh, this was this would put us about uh, Thanksgiving time, just past Thanksgiving time, before Christmas, and uh, 40, 40, 44, and uh, we were alerted just overnight without knowing anything about anything going on. We kept abreast of the news as best we could in combat, in a, being in a, a base camp like that, away from our combat situation. We didn't have too much going on for us except trying to stay busy and keep people from getting in trouble because he wasn't in combat and that's kind of a tough situation for no combat man to to reconcile himself to a, anything as calm and serene as being in the rear echelon. And so we were alerted then on the 22nd of December, 44, and uh, lacking aircraft being available and also the, the snow was falling and a lot of tough winter coming on and the visibility was reduced and we didn't have aircraft flying and we went to Stavelot, Belgium on with uh, surface transports, trucks sure. and so so forth. That we had a lot of uh, what we call S and T's. Then was they were uh, the type of trailers that was hooked behind a, a tractor situation and had some, some creature comforts and it had a canvas over the top of it at least. Yeah. And it's uh, about the time of the Battle of the Bulge. This is right. Solvent. It's exactly right. We was deploying there to take over a position that was overrun by von Rennstadt's army uh, for the uh, what we used to be called the Golden Second line. Division. They were ran, they ran right through them. That was one of the big thrusts of the battle when Rennstadt came through, and so we had to go in and fill that void in the line. And uh, of course, the the bulge was a notoriously famous uh, battle situation because they did cause quite a a time a tussle for the, the Allied forces, British and American, to, because Rennstedt had made this last thrust and it was sort of a, a last attempt to get a sufficient land army for the Germans to make this thrust and trying to go into uh, into Liège and, and uh, different places in Belgium and France before we just came through and had already consolidated a lot of ground. But we had to retake this and straighten the line up, and this was our mission to do that in this area where we went. Being our division was one of the of the many personnel that was deployed for that situation. We didn't do that alone. <laughs> you should understand yeah, that. Yeah. We had a lot of help. Sure. And uh, you got through. Uh, the war was over. Uh, the next uh, summer or next spring, yes, of course. Yes, spring and summer. What did you do after that, Calvin? Well, we deployed down to the southern part of France uh, <clears throat> shortly after the bulge. After we finished that mission up there, and uh, being in the 82nd Division was uh, assigned to the Fifth Army, Third uh, Army, which was Patton's unit, and uh, we was uh, kept for his reserve. He wanted us to be ready to be deployed at any time because he was traveling pretty fast and didn't know just exactly what they might come into contact with, and especially, especially with forces nearer to probably the land or any land armies that there was at the time because it was getting closer and closer to Berlin and places like that. And a race to Berlin was pretty important for Patton. So. Yeah. We were kept in case he got in trouble. We were supposed to go up and help him out. Good. Do you remember where you were when the war was over in Europe? Uh, we had returned uh, close to our, our initial base camp into uh, Sassone, Belgium, and then uh, we stayed there. Um, well, we were down at Garonne is when, when the war was over. See. Actually, we had moved from one to the other, and actually when the sure. war was over and they told us the fighting was over, so. We had just re returned to Grown, Belgium. The 82nd go home as a division, or no? We uh, broke up. I was one of the few people. Well, quite a quite a few people. And he announced the uh, initiation of the uh, point system, and he was allowed to have two points for time in combat, two point two, two points per year, however it was, and then. 
he was allowed so many points for medals and combat situations you were in and I and I think you needed 85 points to get out and I had 135 and you, you well qualified <laughs> so <laughs> they give me they did give me a I had the the uh, you know, the situation where I met with my company, my battalion, my regimental commander, and he uh, had an interview with all of us, and uh, that was going home, and he said, you, you gentlemen, he called us <laughs> at that time, uh, have enough points to go home. However, he said, we would appreciate having your services and your, the abilities that you have around to take up our positions that we're going to have with uh, the peacetime army. So they sent my regiment, my whole regiment, up to Frankfurt on the Main to uh, be escorts. And you know, this this was just exactly what all paratroopers had in mind when they got the paratroopers to go uh, escort <laughs> congressmen and and uh, senators and so forth and foreign dignitaries to headquarters and so forth. And that was a, the job our our guys inherited I was on my way home so I didn't have to yeah. do that because I didn't I didn't like it a bit more than I did. <laughs> uh, did did you uh, exit the army then at that time? Yeah we went home uh, I got home um, actually in the states and would, uh, was released from active duty on 28th of August 45 and uh, at the Camp Jaffe Arkansas and there there we returned to my home station was I was living then at Oklahoma at that time so I'm an Okie too uh, Calvin where yeah. do you live in Oklahoma may I ask well I lived in uh, Seminole County for quite a while went to junior high school high school in that area and, I see uh, okay. then landed, uh, wound up in Okmulgee Oklahoma where I enlisted for service at okay so you stayed in the service then after no no oh, I you I enlisted did, there originally. I did rejoin the National Guard I'd yeah. been in the National Guard previous okay. to that and then okay. I my uh, took the tests again and got my commission all straightened out and and uh, joined rejoined the National Guard in uh, 47. Sure. Calvin, how do you feel about your training uh, in, in the military? Do you feel that uh, the paratroop training was sufficient, that uh, uh, you went overseas well trained? It's uh, probably the best training that I ever had and of course I'm a little prejudiced about my training earlier on and when I was still in high school I told a little white lie about my age and joined the National Guard when I was just 16 years old. I had to get a release from the National Guard to join the regular army. Sure. So they gave me a release from the National Guard on January the 2nd. I'd rejoin the regular army on January 3rd of 40. So Then I rejoined the National Guard and, and I, I think some of the best training I had was right there. But the 82nd Airborne and the Airborne training certainly was uh, rigorous uh, mm -hmm. and more extensive and expansive than we had just on Monday nights <laughs> in the National Guard. When did you get out of the National Guard? Uh, did that. Uh, <coughs> that happened just before they called, uh, alerted the, the troops to go to Korea. About 23 days I had sent my... Uh, uh, resignation into the Oklahoma National Guard so I could rejoin a, a Kansas Guard, which never happened. I just, just didn't go back in. I uh -huh. visited some companies and battalions and and interviewed. But I just never did rejoin the, the Guard. guard. Uh, after the war, there were a lot of provisions made for the veterans, like the GI Bill. Did you uh, use any of uh, this type of thing? Yeah, I did uh, to some extent. I I got uh, pilot's training and became a, a, a pilot, but uh, and I intended to be a commercial pilot. But uh, life's uh, re responsibilities change. Your person's sure. wants and likes and dislikes a lot, as you know. Sure do. And uh, I stayed with the company that I was working for, the Phillips Petroleum Company, and. And I stayed with them 17 years, and later I went to work at Fort Riley for about 17 years. So, Were you with Phillips in Bartlesville, or where were you located? In, in, you know, I initially was in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. You were? They closed that refinery and built a large refinery in Kansas City, and I went to Kansas City. I see. 
And Calvin, you'll be congratulated for your service to the nation, and uh, you certainly had a very successful service. Is there anything uh, that you'd like to tell us about the service, or uh, have we left anything out at this point? Well, I'd just like to say that uh, I appreciate you gentlemen asking me to respond to these uh, things that we've just gone through, but uh, and, I, and I do uh, want to say that I was fortunate enough to be in a training command for a long enough time that I was well qualified when I went into combat to do what I was trained to do. So that is one of the reasons why I guess I'm still here talking to you gentlemen. Calvin, I'm real glad to hear you say that because we want to be able to sh we want all of our people to be well trained before they're forced to do this type of thing. 82nd. I guess you um, know that the 82nd course is still operational. And it's over yes. there, mm -hmm. overseas right today. Um, we have two uh, airborne divisions, 82nd and 101st, and uh, they're operational today. And uh, as I say, I'm quite uh, uh, I, I admire what went on on in the in the uh, paratroop uh, effort. Is there anything else we should take up before we wind this up? I think that's just about anything. I could probably bore you guys with my uh, exploits for a couple of three hours, but I don't want to do that. Uh, uh, all of the things that I did it didn't make me any anything of a hero or anything. I just did what I was told to do and, and uh, led the people that I was in charge of to do the same thing. Thank you again, Calvin. You're welcome.